So thanks, Jason, and thank you all for coming. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I would like to thank a lot Jose for the invitation to come here and for the nice hospitality. And uh, we have seen uh, a little bit of the local culture, which has been very nice. And you Australians are very nice people. So thank you. It's a very good pleasure to be here. So uh, today we are, our seminar will be about the Myrtle Rust. I think it's uh, one of the most uh, uh, important diseases in Australia at the moment, because it was recently, recently introduced here. So uh, this is the, 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 the topics that uh, I'm going to talk about. Uh, first, I would like to show you that where we come from. Okay? Uh, as I showed for some of you that uh, listened to me last, uh, last Friday, uh, he is Brazil and he is Australia. So as I mentioned previously, Australia and Brazil shares a lot of common interest and common climate conditions. So in the also we have many or some many or some problems of common interest. Uh, I am a professor at the University of Viçosa. Uh, Viçosa is a small town in the southeast state of Brazil, uh, about uh, 400 k from Rio de Janeiro, a famous town uh, in Brazil that most of you have heard about, especially about Carnival. Here, Rio de Janeiro is special uh, by its nice carnival uh, once a year. Sometimes it takes uh, one week or more for a nice uh, uh, party. And Viçosa uh, uh, is, is also in the southeast of the state of Minas Gerais, one of the biggest, largest states in Brazil is Minas Gerais. And the best, of course. Okay. <laughs> So you have, if you go to Brazil, you have to go to Minas Gerais, okay? It's the same as if you go in Italy, in Rome, and you don't see the Pope. So you have to go, if you go to Brazil, you have to go and see Minas Gerais State. So it's a, it's a university town, university town. It's a very small town, uh, 73,000 people. Uh, our climate is quite comfortable, it's tropical altitude. And uh, we are at uh, about uh, 648 meters altitude. Uh, the average uh, temperature, the maximum average temperature during the rainy summer is 28 degrees. And the minimum, you have a dry winter, 8 degrees. So it's, uh, I think you have some cities in, in Australia which are quite similar, maybe uh, Sydney, uh, Melbourne, I don't know. <laughs> uh, probably very close to this. So that's uh, an overview of the campus. I work at the plant pathology department, but uh, I, I am at the biotech institute, which is here. And uh, Okay. So uh, last year we have about 17,000 students, students which uh, is a medium university, university in, in Brazil, uh, including undergraduate, graduate, graduate non-degree students and high school students. So uh, we have all kinds of uh, students at, at the university. And uh, we have six, 65 undergraduate courses and uh, we have uh, we are very strong in, uh, in agricultural science, mainly agronomy, forestry, medical veterinary, and, um, and more more recently we have had other courses like uh, medicine, and also civil engineering, and other and some other human uh, science courses, and we have. Uh, 65 and uh, 45 master 
é, é, Costas and 23 PhD. And uh, we have a very a good, uh, a deep interest in international relations. We have currently more than uh, 90 academic agreements with more than 30 countries, especially US uh, and some countries in Europe and in South America. We have currently 2,000 uh, students abroad and uh, 200 foreign students. Uh, <clears throat> the Brazilian government presently has a, 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 a program called a Science Without Borders. I mean, uh, uh, this, in this program, it provides fellowship for the students, undergrads or graduate students. They can go, if they, they choose the count they want to go, and they spend one year, one year and a half, or uh, six months at a minimum. And it's, it has been a very good program for exchanging if, and, uh, and also to, to get knowledge of the, 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 the culture and also improve uh, some uh, local uh, language skills. So it's, it has been a, a very good program in the last years. And the, uh, the Brazilian government also invests a lot in, in training people at the, the uh, graduate level. So generally, our, in my university, for example, uh, more than 90% of the professors or the lecturers had their PhD in US, uh, Canada, or Europe. So it's a very good policy in, in, the, in that, that way. And to have uh, some foreign students, mainly from South America, the Brazilian government also provides a fellowship uh, for students uh, from South, South America, Africa, uh, and uh, so we have quite a few students, mainly from Colombia, uh, some from Chile and uh, Peru, etc. So uh, let's start talking a little bit about our talk. First, I would like to to show you a little bit about eucalyptus. So uh, eucalyptus is native here. Most of the species, and maybe just one, is native in Indonesia, Europhila, but most eucalyptus are native here. And in Brazil, uh, eucalyptus have a very high growth rate, uh, especially in tropical sites. And our current mean, it's about uh, 40 cubic meters per hectare per year. And it, in our rotation age is about seven years, which means that we have uh, two, 208 cubic meters per hectare. Uh, some people uh, think that we have even a little bit higher average, but I'm a little bit conservative, so I think 40 cubic meters per hectare per year is a good number. But in some sites, in some, for some crones, uh, it may reach up to 90, 80 to 90 cubic meters per hectare per year. It's, it grows a lot. And we have also some da recent data showing that some crones can reach up to 150 cubic meters per, hect per hectare. 150 cubic meters per hectare. So it's a lot, okay? And every year new clones are, are being developed. And so it's, it, it's, there is a, a lot of uh, new, uh, better uh, uh, clones uh, arriving every year. So uh, currently we have a program uh, of uh, integ uh, integration eucalypts with different crops and cattle and horses. It's a, a very good system uh, to keep the local people in their own land. Uh, and they can uh, keep growing the original uh, crop, but they can also improve the profit uh, planting Eucalypts are producing fiber, which is very important for them for their own use and also to, to sell for different uses. So we can 
combine eucalyptus de rice uh, with wheat, with corn, with soybean, with sunflower, with peanuts, and we harvest the crop and we seed uh, the grass, then we can have, uh, we can raise cattle or horses. So it's a very good system. As I mentioned in my previous presentation, uh, in Brazil there are a lot of the, the, the greeners that do not like eucalyptus. They say that eucalyptus take out a lot of water from the soil and uh, they, they, they take, take a lot of nutrients from the soil, which is a misconception because we have proved that eucalyptus takes so much nutrient so much water as many other crops. So once we have this uh, integration, so it's eucalyptus is becoming now a very friendly plant. Okay, so it's very important. But and most of our plantations are homogeneous plantations, and uh, uh, the companies, the, uh, most of the plantations in Brazil are are private. And the companies play a very important role in preserving the native vegetation. You can integrate the, the clonal plantation with the native vegetation. Otherwise, this here, if, if we didn't have uh, the, the plantation, the eucalyptus plantation, probably uh, this native vegetation had been cut for, for some reason. So, it reduces the pressure. If you plant, we reduce the pressure on the native vegetation. So it's very important. Uh, the the plantain, eucalyptus plantains play a very important role in preserving the native vegetation. And the, the wild animals can, uh, the corridors, okay, they can move around and, and, and have a nice time, actually. <laughs> so this is a model used by the, uh, the forest companies. Uh, so they preserve the, the native vegetation along the rivers, for example, lakes, differently from other uh, growers, like uh, people that grow cattle or use the, the land for other use. So the companies, again, play a very important role in preserving the native vegetation. In general, for every 1.8 hectares, they live on hectare of uh, natural vegetation. Uh, we have current, uh, currently uh, a little bit over 7 million hectares of, for, uh, of forest plantations in Brazil. And most of it is eucalyptus, 71%. It, it makes about over a little bit over 5 million hectares of uh, plantation. And second, pines, 1.5, about 1.5 million hectares of pine plantations. Main uh, uh, pinus eliotti, or eliota, I don't know how to pronounce correctly. And pinus taeda, but uh, it's a second uh, plantation. Currently, there is a, a change. Many people, or um, uh, most companies, are uh, tend to plant more eucalyptus than pines. Some that used to plant pines are changing for eucalyptus because it's a multi, multiple use purpose of the uh, of the wood and also because it's high growth rate and so on. So, uh, but there is a tendency to increase most more eucalyptus than pines. And we also have other species, um, maybe half a million hectares uh, of African mahogany. Not, we are talking just about about African mahogany. And uh, other species like Toona ciliata, which is native here, Toona ciliata, and some native, uh, 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 native plants in Brazil like uh, Schizolobium amazonicum, and uh, many, many of these species. A, 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 a black acacia, you, 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 you call it here block water or something like this, okay? But mainly eucalyptus and pines. Uh, the forestry industry uses the eucalyptus wood mainly for charcoal to be used in the steel industry. 
And as I mentioned previously, uh, we have uh, developed a, a, a technology to produce charcoal without pollution. Uh, the, uh, the smoke coming from the, the burning is burned and, uh, and also it generates energy that can be used uh, in the, uh, the property. So it's a, it's, it's a recent and very nice technology to avoid pollution in the environment. But eucalyptus is mainly used for pulp and paper. Okay, in Brazil, short fiber uh, paper. And also for a solid wood, especially for uh, fence poles and for furniture. I think this would be one of the best uses of the wood, eucalyptus wood, in the future. And also for energy. Currently, there are also some tendency to use the eucalyptus for energy uh, to produce uh, biomass, okay? And, uh, to generate energy. Uh, so we have to plant. We have to plant eucalyptus, we have to supply wood. There is a, a need, an increasing need for wood. And we, have, we are expanding our plantations. And as the, as the plantations ex expand, we also have several disease outbreaks, like uh, Cryphonectra, Chrysoport cancer, Eritrea somnolyph cancer, Cetosis wilt that we talked last uh, Friday, Houstonia wilt, Ervinia wilt, that two bacteria, important bacteria at, at the moment, some leaf blights, uh, uh, fungal and bacterial leaf blights, several we have, and the rust, eucalyptus rust or myrtle rust. Or so uh, let's talk now about the real talk, OK? Uh, <clears throat> so Puxilip CGI uh, was first described in Brazil in the South State of Santa Catarina, the, 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 the city of San Francisco Sul, in 1884. 60 years eight, later, it was described on Corimbe Citriodora, uh, in Rio de Janeiro uh, state, Itaguaí. And 30 years later, we had the same, re the first report of rust on eucalyptus grandis, uh, a South African provenance of eucalyptus, which was highly uh, infected by, by the rust. Since then, we have had several worldwide rust outbreaks every year. Uh, we have given, or uh, several names have been given to the to the this disease, which sometimes make a little confusion. But uh, it was first described as guava rust, and then eucalyptus rust, and ohia rust, myrtle rust, and so on. So in general, people or the researchers give the name that they they are they like more. All right, but. Uh, there is a tendency to keep the name that uh, was first described. But anyway, for this disease, we have had several names. Uh, in Brazil, because I work with eucalyptus, and because eucalyptus is my favorite tree, I use eucalyptus rust. Uh, but in here, people are using myrtle rust, which is uh, acceptable. Uh, So we have done several studies uh, on this disease along the years. Uh, this disease was first described on eucalyptus in, in 1944. Uh, and from 1980 to, uh, to the year 2000, we have done most epidemiology and interspecific studies on, on inter, inter and interspecific resistance to evaluate uh, how the species would behave. And uh, in this period from 2000 to 2003, uh, we started um, uh, our studies, or we did most studies, phenotyping clones and families for resistance, development of a disease severity scale, which is largely used uh, in Brazil and even here, development, discovery, and mapping 
uh, a gene for resistance we call PPR1. Actually, this was the first gene uh, described uh, for resistance in eucalyptus. And uh, uh, in this period, 2003, 2008, uh, our work was mostly on epidemiology, histopathology, development of markers for identification of pathogen, and population genetic studies of Poxinip CGI, inheritance of resistance, and KTL mapping. And from 2008, uh, uh, the research has been driving most on positional cloning of PPR1, transgenic plants containing PPR1, and studies on gene function and chemical control. So we still have a lot to know about the disease. Right? And since now it has been found several causes, I think our knowledge will increase a lot about this disease. So uh, this fungus has a very broad host range. It's not common for a biotrophic pathogen like uh, Poxymphysid, but it has a very uh, host, broad host range. Uh, if we count the host that has been described here in Australia, so currently we have over 350 host species for this host. So it's very has a very broad host range <clears throat> from different genus, okay, different genus from Angophora to Cisigium. So uh, this disease infects only juvenile leaves, shoots, floral buds, flowers, and fruits. It never infects old lesions, only is a very juvenile leaves. And causes it causes necrosis, deformation, mini cankers on shoots, and the yellow pustules that formed on the lesions are the main characteristic feature to, for the identification of the disease. So here we can see the, <clears throat> the yellow mass of mass of spores on eucalyptus globulus, and as disease develops we can see the dead at tips. We saw a lot here, you know, so I'm gonna show you some pictures. We saw a lot here. So uh, it, it looks like that someone applied a herbicide in some case, okay? And you can also see some uh, is, uh, small cankers, gold like this. It's also common in some host species. Uh, uh, this on coppice, coppice is the most, one of the most uh, susceptible, is the most susceptible to, to the rest because it's very, uh, the tissue is very uh, juicy. So, uh, and then the fungus can kill the tips, the apex, and somehow it sometimes can also kill the entire plant like this after coppice. Uh, this on guava, the fungus uh, infects guava mainly on the, the floral buds and fruits, but sometimes on young leaves. It's not so common on leaves, so it's more common on floral buds and on, on, on the fruits. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. <laughs> no, that's this, okay? Uh, this. Uh, Cisigium jambus. Uh, I have a, that's the mistake, okay? I'm sorry. This is not Cisigium. This is Cisigium. No. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's, it's wrong here. And uh, this is Eugenia uniflora. Uh, in fact, leaves and fruits of, of cherry, Eugenia uniflora. Sorry about Cisigium jambus, okay? It, it's, it's wrong here. Uh, we tried to correct this mistake, but we didn't pick it up yesterday. <laughs> That's a uh, half a uh, fault. <laughs> <laughs> half is my son. Okay, he is a, a plant pathologist. He he just finished his PhD uh, in plant pathology, and he should have seen this. But he didn't. <laughs> so half that's your fault. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. So this uh, Eugenia Uniflora. 
and uh, you can see here it's the fruit uh, is highly uh, severely affected and especially in, also inside look how, how many spores as far are formed inside uh, the, the the fruit okay this is very important host okay so please forget this so this uh, uh, and now it is Cisidium jambus. That Cisidium jambus, uh, a species that we are just talking uh, a few minutes ago, and it's highly susceptible. It's one of the most susceptible hosts hosts that we have in Brazil, and it produces so many spores that we used it to to multiply the spores for mass inoculation. And this you can see a Cisidium jambus in Hawaii. This disease was also reported in Hawaii a few years ago. And Cisidium jambus is one of the most susceptible species. It's, it's exotic, it's an exotic plant there, but it's quite susceptible, as in here. In here, uh, it's highly susceptible. And most plants that we saw were highly infected. So it, it can be used as an indicator plant. So if you if if you want wants to see if you have rust in a place, look at the jambos, Cisidium jambos, are highly susceptible, and maybe here now we have also some other species like uh, Rhodomyrtus psidioides, which is highly susceptible, and the other half is Eugenia haywardsiana, haywardsiana. I don't know how to pronounce correctly. So anyway, jambo, Cisium jambo is highly susceptible. So that's uh, Mirciaria jambuticaba. It's a be nice, beautiful uh, fruit, but it's highly the fruits uh, are highly susceptible, and we, we rarely find the disease on the leaves, but most uh, commonly we found the disease we find the disease on uh, on the fruits. It gets sweeter, actually. Okay, yeah, it's it, it gets sweeter. It's nice, uh, full of protein. <laughs> okay. So the scenario is Okay. 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 So this uh, oh, here lives. It, it's a native plant to uh, to Hawaii. I don't, I don't know if it's native here too, but it's certainly in Hawaii. Do you have it here? Yeah. No, no. Uh, it's hard. It's, it, actually, uh, in Hawaii, the Cisidium jambus are much more successful than here. Uh, but I'm going to show you later. In Brazil, uh, it's highly successful to some of our races or strains. Okay? The Cisidium, the Metrocidus. Uh, So that's Calisum viminaza. I, I noticed that it was recently they changed the name to Bellaleuca viminaza. Is that correct? Okay. So uh, we have we have seen a lot of Calisum here, but uh, just we got some in, in cans, but uh, most are, are free. This is free. In Brazil, it occurs mainly in, the, in nurseries, but not in the field. We actually we, we use this as a ornamental plant. So we have a lot of these plants in the, in the, in the, along the streets. But they are pretty healthy in Brazil, except in some nurseries. So that's uh, Eugenia florida. I think it's, it, it's actually it's a native plant in Brazil. You can see the fruit, highly infected, and also the tips. And I was told that it's a weed here. It was, it's a weed here in, in Australia. And that's a Heteropix natalensis. It's a native plant to South Africa, which is also highly susceptible. This species, uh, uh, until recently, uh, was placed in, in, in the Heteropix daisy family, but currently it's changed to Myrtaceae. So, so it's Myrtaceae. So, but it's highly susceptible uh, plant. So, uh, uh, Puxine psidi, 
CGI or CG has an incomplete life cycle, lacking the peaking stage. And under uh, higher temperatures, maybe over 25 degrees, we may have telospore, telospore formation. Uh, the telospore, telospores are not uh, rarely found in nature, but sometimes we, we have telospore formation under higher temperatures. And this, uh, if you have a temperature in a range of 15 to 25 degrees uh, and free water, you need water, uh, they may germinate and produce basidiospores. And uh, one of my students recently found that uh, the basidiospores uh, uh, can be binucleate. They, have, they can have two uh, nuclei, uh, and uh, it's actually it's very common in, on, in the Puccinia uh, species. Uh, so this uh, originospores, uh, sorry, this basidiospores, uh, when they germinate and penetrate, they will form astrospores. And the astrospores can infect and produce originospores. So the origine state is the repetitive uh, uh, stage of the rust. So they keep producing originospores would keep producing originospores. So it's the most important phase of the cycle is the origine stage, which is very common. Are that those yellow mass of spore that we see on the host tissue. The telospore stage are a little bit darker. They are, they are brown, a little bit brown, but, uh, but they are very rare. But the, the originospore stage is the most common, the most important. And somehow, uh, sometimes, and somehow, uh, the uh, originospore germinating can also uh, form uh, pushes of, of telospores, closing. And the life cycle. So we consider this as a, a macrocyclic and autoaceous disease. I mean, the whole cycle happens in the same host. Although it's lacking a peak stage, it's considered as a, a macrocyclic uh, uh, rust. So here we have the Originia uh, stage that I was talking about, the yellow. Nice yellow color. And here the tail stage is brown. And this is very rare. Uh, rare. They are not common. I think in this trip that uh, we made here, we could see some, we suspect that we have some uh, tail spores, but we are not so sure. We have to check in the microscope. And if when the basidiospore, the telospore germinate, they germinate under favorable conditions, they will form the basidiospores. Okay? Uh, but what is the role of the basidiospores? Do they play any role, <coughs> any biological role, uh, for the disease develop, development? So one of my PhD student, uh, Patricia. Patricia is coming here to Australia for one year. She, she's going to stay with Dr. Morin Glenn at uh, Robert. Did, did I pronounce correctly? Tasmania. Tasmania. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. So she will stay there with uh, Dr. Morin Glenn, Morin Glenn to, to do part of her PhD on the sandwich type program that we have. And she's trying to, uh, to, to know the, the role, the biological role of the basidiospores. Do they infect? So far, she has not find, found a penetration on the host tissue. Okay? They germinate, but she didn't find that. But actually, she has to keep it to see more events. She has to do more observations. But according to the uh, previous paper, the basidial spores infect. So, but we would like to, to see now how it, if it's really uh, true. 
And after there is another researcher here in Australia trying to, to prove the same role of the basidiospores, spores, which is in, very interesting. Uh, along the years, we have also developed, uh, uh, in cooperation with the, uh, the Australians, and this is a paper by Steve Langrell, and uh, we developed a molecular marker and nested PCR uh, to detect the fungus on symptomless uh, leaf tissue. So it's very important for diagnostic purposes. So let's say if you suspect that in the, in the pollen or in pollen or on leaves uh, you have the, the fungus, you can take just a piece of the tissue and run a nest PCR to detect, to make sure that it's disease free or not, okay, to import or not. So it's very important for quarantine purposes. Okay, so uh, also uh, in cooperation with some um, uh, US colleagues, we developed some microsatellite markers, which has, has, have been very useful to study the, uh, the fungal diversity, the population genetics of the fungus, and also to track down the, the fungal pathway in different countries. That's one of the projects that we are currently developing is to use microsatellite markers uh, to trace, uh, to track down the, the fungal path pathway in different places. Let's say, why, uh, wh where did the fungus from Australia, uh, in Australia came from? Okay, it's from Brazil, it's from Japan, it's from Hawaii, and so on. Okay, so we are using this market. And fortunately, the strain that we have here is different from South America. It's quite close to the one that you that we have in Hawaii, in California, and in Florida, but different from the one that we have in Brazil. But actually, we are screening more markers and getting more samples around the world uh, to to make sure uh, the origin of the fungus and how it's moving around. Okay, so it's it's very important understand that. So uh, this fungus is can be considered a, fun, a fungus or a disease on the move. It's moving around. It was first uh, described uh, in Brazil and since then has been described in several South America and Central America countries in Florida, uh, in Mexico, in California and Hawaii in 2010. 2006, sorry, uh, and then in Australia, 2010, okay, March 2010, and uh, recently it was reported in New Caledonia, maybe four, four months ago, something like that, was detected there, and at the end of June, it was detected in South Africa. And it, it is, uh, there is also a report of the disease here in, so, in South China, in a, in a island or place in, in South China. So there are some other, uh, in Japan, okay, it was detected also in Japan, it was described in Japan, 2011. So it's, it has been, I am not sure about the dates, okay, I think I'm, I'm confusing all the dates. I think 2011 was in, was in, in, in China, okay? Uh, and, and there is also, there are also other places that the disease may be uh, introduced. Anyway, it's an intercontinental, uh, it's a fungus, a disease of intercontinental interest, okay? So, uh, some time ago, uh, travel bus and, uh, and made a, a a predict model for 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 the disease spread, okay? For the disease spread, oh, I mean, uh, 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 the most uh, risk areas uh, for Australia, and here in blue, you can see the most uh, uh, suitable areas for rust, okay? 
uh, this was based, uh, I'm very pleased that uh, for this model, because it was based in, in the work that we had done along the years, the epidemiology, epidemiology data that we supply, and it's matching very well with what's happening here in Australia. Uh, this map was passed to me by Angus Carnegie some time ago, but currently the disease, I think it's up here half of it. Okay? We have seen the disease up here. And uh, how about Keynes, uh, 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 Darwin? So I think we have a little chance, maybe it's possible in the future to find the disease here in the North Territory, I think. But we have to see. So we have to keep our eye on it. <laughs> OK? Uh, there is a, I think here is a little bit drier and hotter. But uh, maybe we can have some microclimate, especially in the gardens, in the, royal, the, the gardens, in the nurseries, where the conditions are more suitable. So we have to keep an eye on it. Okay. But if it's here, so now we have to manage it. And I have some clues how to, to manage the disease, okay? as we have done in Brazil. So, uh, the infection process uh, is highly dependent on leaf wetness, temperature, light intensity and photo period, and host age. I, I, I keep saying that this disease, this fungus, is like a, biolog a biological clock watch. Okay? It, it, it's very predictable. Okay? But uh, we need uh, all this together. So this is the best disease to understand the triangle, the disease triangle. Okay, that it has to, it, it works pretty nicely. So the infection uh, uh, for process starts with the spore germination, with the gene, especially the gene spore germination, and there is a, a formation of the appressorium, appressorium formation, uh, intercellular colonization, and uh, intracellular formation haustorium, which is important for, for the fungus to get uh, its nutrients, haustorium formation, and sporulation. The, the whole cycle, the average uh, latent period, the mean latent period is 12 days to complete the whole life cycle. So it's, it's quite uh, short. Okay? It, 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 it generates uh, a lot of spores in a very short period. So here we can see it's, this is a key issue. Okay? We need dew, we need moisture. It's very important for the spore germination. So here they have the original spore germination, apresor formation, and the outstor formation. But we need dew. We need uh, dew or rain. Fog days are very important for rust infection. Fog days. And the infection occurs mainly in the night because the light uh, uh, exposures, exposure to light inhibits spore germination. So this is a, a paper that uh, one of my students, of one of my students, she published uh, about the, the infection process of the fungus. And for this disease, it's very common we, uh, to find a hypersensitive reaction type. I mean, the host recognizes recognize the, recognize the, the fungus, presence of the fungus, and kills. And, uh, the, the, uh, and the, the cells around the, the infection point are, uh, they die, and the fungus does not uh, go further. Because it's, it's a biotrophic pathogen. It needs the alive tissue. So it's a way of the host to to react and to protect itself. Okay, so sometimes it's uh, very common. It's very common to find this uh, hypersensitive type of reaction, and sometimes the response is so so quickly that you don't see anything. Okay, that, like that we call like an immune type of reaction. But actually, the fungus had penetrated 
and uh, and 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 cause an, an un undetected uh, lesion like this. Uh, when you have a compatible interaction, the, so the fungus penetrate and colonize, uh, then you have a compatible interaction. And this uh, here we have an incompatible interaction. Uh, the death of the the surrounding cells. Then we, what we see outside, of, can see with our eyes, is this type of reaction. So this is incompatible, and this is a compatible. Okay, so it's very simple. Okay. And here we here we can see different type of uh, hypersensitive reaction. Sometimes even the 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 the, uh, the leaves are are detached, are, are they, they fall, the leaves fall. So, uh, in terms of epidemiology, it's very important uh, to, to understand this, uh, that favorable conditions for infection are juvenile organs. Temperature in the range of the best uh, is 20 to 25 degrees, but it can, may have a, a wider, broader range. But uh, the best would be around here. The estimated best temperature is 23 degrees. A prolonged nighttime leaf wetness period or uh, fog days also are very important for infection. And we need just six to eight hours of uh, leaf wetness for the fungal, fungus to penetrate. Unfavorable, unfavorable conditions include mature or old organs, temperature over 30 and below 10. The fungus do not germinate uh, above 30 or below 10 degrees and absence of leaf wetness and light. So that's just, just a summary of what, what we have published in the late 80s, but it's, it's very important, it works nicely. Uh, we have also done some work, some work on the survival and dispersal of poxinipsidium, spores, the eucalypt wood products, because it's very important uh, to know, would the fungus come on on shipments on wood? Uh, okay. So we did this work, and we uh, this uh, student uh, she tested different temperatures and different under different uh, relative humidities, and we used two methods. We use a fluorescent acetate method to. Uh, to see the, if the spores were alive or not, and a germination on water again. So the method, or FDA method, was, was more accurate, and we, we found that 70% variability, uh, viability of original spores in type of spores, and uh, by germination, uh, we, we found 20% viability for original spores and 25% for tender spores. I mean, it's it's more reliable to use the FDA method because some spores, they may be alive, but somehow they do not germinate quite well on, on water uh, agar. And now we know that if we treat the spores with some mineral uh, oil, we can improve the germination. Uh, so that's something that we, uh, we could do later. But anyway, Survival of poxinipsid is best at 15 degrees and 35% relative humidity. So it's, it survives better under low temperature and lower uh, uh, humidity. And the original spores can live up to 90 days and tender spores 150 and 20 days. And survival was, was minimum. Uh, at 25 degrees, 25 and 30 degrees, and 70 percent relative humidity, and they could last only 20 days for original spores and only 30 days for tender spores. So actually, it's this fungus have a, a very short uh, living period. Uh, uh, actually, so uh, in conclusion, 
increase in relative humidity and in temperature of storage reduce survival of Fuxina pisidia. Another important point is the physiological variability of the fungus. And this has been proved by several workers since uh, the, uh, the mid-90s and up to the most recently. So we have several uh, researchers claiming uh, the physiological variability of the fungus. And uh, uh, although it has been extensively uh, studied and, and, and cited in the literature, we think we still need to understand a little more. And uh, uh, Patricia, that I, I recently mentioned, uh, so she's trying to, uh, to do a more detailed, detailed study on, on that. And she's uh, doing a, a nice sampling of the fungus in Brazil and do some, doing some cross inoculations. So here we have the original host, and here we have the, the original host where the fungus uh, came from, and these have the plants that were inoculated. So let's uh, see, for example, uh, this is uh, Pisidium guinense, which is a very interesting host. Okay, the fungus from Pisidium guinense can infect eucalyptus itself, right? Pisidium guinense, Pisidium guajava, Pisidium jambus, and Myrciara coliflora. I mean, it infects everything except Eugenia uniflora. Although we have to repeat this for Eugenia uniflora, but apparently the population of the fungus for Eugenia uniflora is, is, different, is, physiological, is physio physiologically different. Uh, because if you take the fungus from uh, Eugenia uniflora, uh, we can see this that it did infect eucalyptus, infected Pisidiginensis, and Cisira jambus. And uh, we don't know why, but it did infect the plant that we, we inoculated from, from Eugenia uniflora. So it, it's, it's possible that we had some problems in the age in the leaf age, or some maybe that clone that we are using, that plant, was not compatible with that uh, uh, strain. So it, it, it's possible. But this, uh, we, are, uh, we would like to do a whole genome sequencing uh, to understand a little bit more uh, of this, uh, of these uh, two strains, uh, plus the one that's the most common one in Brazil. So uh, we still uh, keep doing, uh, doing a lot of inoculations, collecting and inoculations in different host species. You can see here uh, the fungus from Myrciara coliflora, in fact, the eucalyptus, Cisirum jambus, Pisidiginensis, Myrciara coliflora, but did not infect Pitanga, Eugenia uniflora, and Pisidium guajava. The same. Uh, the fungus from Cisir jambus infect eucalyptus, Cisir jambus, Myrciara coliflora, Pisidiginens, but did not infect guava. Uh, the fungus from Pisidio guajava infected Pisidio guajava, Pisidiginens, but did not infect the eucalyptus, Myrciara coliflora, and Cisir jambus. So the guajava fungus is interesting too. Uh, because of this variability, and also because in Hawaii, the ohia plants are not so susceptible to the fungus like a uh, rose apple, uh, we did a, a, a piece of work with the U.S. colleagues and the Hawaiian colleagues uh, to test our strains against uh, ohia plants. And we showed that we have shown that it was part of Rodrigo's uh, PhD thesis. He was one of my, uh, for his own, my former graduate uh, PhD students. And he showed that the fungus do not infect, the fungus 
from Guava and from uh, Ficirio Guinense did not infect the Ohia plants. But we had others, race one, race four, and the one isolate on a strain from this area called Florida, infected badly uh, the Ohia plants. So uh, this is very important that, like uh, in, uh, here in Australia, many, uh, some researchers are, are testing uh, some plant material, important plant material. So we would like to test against our races in Brazil to see if they will keep, will maintain the resistance. So it's, it may, it's possible that we have uh, different races in Brazil that could infect some uh, of uh, resistant uh, Australian plants here with tests with the local strain. So we have uh, races. We have also described some races of Puccinia pisidia. What, uh, what is race? So race is a, a phototype, a, 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 a strain of the fungus that is able to infect different uh, uh, crones of varieties of a, of a species. So uh, in here, for example, we have uh, this, this, uh, this strain here. Uh, it's compatible to, it, to this, uh, this, this crown here, but is incompatible to, to the others, okay? And, and, uh, and so on. So currently, uh, we have used, to, in our screening, uh, the race one, or race one, which is, seems to be the most spread in Brazil. So the fungus that infect the eucalyptus uh, and it, it also affects different other hosts, but we have some crones that it, it, uh, are not infected by this race. And recently we, we found, it's, it, it will be described shortly, uh, a, another race, race 5, uh, which is compatible with, with this clone. Okay, so it's very important in, in, the, in a screening uh, activity to know the variability of the fungus, to choose the right strain, the right race to, to, to do the screen. And uh, how about the durability of resistance? How many years do the clones keep resistant? So this we have got this data. Uh, this own clone, uh, uh, 621, here comes Grandis. This clone was developed in, in, in the early uh, in, in, in 1980. 89, and this clone was tested by us. It was resistant to race one, and in 2008 it became resistant to another race, race we, we call race four. So the resistance kept for eight, 18, almost 20 years, and it was we also proved recently a new race. Uh, this clone was. Is a, a Uro Grande clone, a hybrid clone. So it, it, this clone was uh, developed in 1994, resist to race one. And this year, we found the disease, and the grower thought that it, that it was they had a problem in of um, herbicide spray, but actually it was rust. Okay, and then we found a race five. So, uh, so the race also, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, this clone also kept resistant for almost 20 years, which is good, actually. In terms of in, in agronomy, in agriculture crops, in general, every five, four to five years, you have to change the variety because, because of new race. So this is it's quite good because uh, this fungus has, has mainly a clonal a multiplication. Okay. So uh, the genetic diversity of Puccinia pisidia population, it, this is part of Rodrigo's PhD thesis, one of my uh, graduate students. And this part of this, this work that I'm going to show here, it was recently accepted for publication there at Molecular Ecology. So Rodrigo uh, did a quite good collection of the fungus in different places in Brazil, 
and uh, in Hawaii. It was a, a, a work that we did in cooperation with the U.S. colleagues. And uh, he found that uh, using this population structure method, uh, using microsatellite markers, uh, he used uh, he, uh, in testing uh, 148 uh, strains of the fungus. Uh, <clears throat> He found two main groups, Piscidio guajava, the fungus from Piscidio guajava, a clustered with the fungus from Piscidio guinense, and the fungus from Cisigio jambos, clustered with the big group here from Eucalyptus. And also, uh, he found uh, three, uh, the yellow, the, the, the third group here, is from Eugenia uniflora, Mysteria cauliflora, and decision community. Uh, but using uh, another different method, uh, using principal coordinate analysis and neighbor, neighbor joint tree, he found that the fungus from eucalyptus and, and Cisigio jambos rosepolis are closer together. Okay? Cisigio jambos and eucalyptus closer together. And the fungus from guava and from psidiginesi also cluster together. And he also found uh, another uh, group of the fungus from Mirciare, Cauliflora, Cisigio Comuni, okay, which uh, formed another group. And the fungus here from California and Hawaii is is pretty similar, okay, it's the same genotype. And also, uh, using this network uh, multilocal genotypes, uh, we also confirm that we have a, a, a big group of the fungus from Eucalyptus and Sigirio jambos, okay? Another group, big group in green here, Sigirio uh, guajava and Sigirio guinensis group. And we have also uh, a group uh, uh, from uh, Mysteria cauliflora, uh, Eugenia uniflora, and Cisigium uh, cumin. Okay, so confirming that we have, apparently, we are having a differentiation by host species. Okay, we have a, 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 the, the fungus. Uh, it's clustered by host species. So, how to control the disease? Actually, many of you are expecting, uh, how, what do we do? How can we control the disease? So, uh, it's the best method, of course, is resistance. And we have a lot of uh, resistant plant material, especially on eucalyptus genus. I don't know about the other species, mutation species here, but for eucalyptus there are plenty of variability. We can have inter-specific uh, resistance, I mean between different species, so some are resistant, some are susceptible. And the most important, at least on eucalyptus, you know, at least for commercial purposes, is the inter-specific inter variability. We can have resistant progenies, and you can plant seedling, I'm going to show you how it's, it can be done. And, but in most cases, we select resistant genotypes and multiply them by cuttings. So, uh, uh, in Brazil, most of our plantations, most of our plantations are by cuttings, clonal plantations. Select the resistant genotypes. But you can also have escape. In some cases, uh, the disease do not occur in some place, or in certain uh, place we can harvest in different times of the year to avoid the, the copies to come in the, in the, in the favorable, in the conducive environment for, for infection. So it can be done. Uh, and also chemical control, especially in nurseries. But for commercial purposes, uh, we think that the best way is resistance. But somehow, some 
Sometimes we can also use fungicide, especially systemic fungicides. We do not recommend protective fungicides, although we have some that are effective, effective, but the efficacy of the systemic fungicides are much greater because they, the fungicide is absorbed by the, the host and translocated to the new shoots that should be protected against the disease. And we have several fungicides which are uh, very effective. And in Brazil, we have just one which is registered for application for eucalyptus, which, which is a mixture of a, a, a triazole with a strobilin. So we apply at every 15 days. We don't have to apply every week. We apply at every 15 days, which gives good control. Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned, the best way is to control by resistance. But how to screen for resistance under controlled conditions? So currently, we have done this in a private company. Uh, it's, it's called Clonar uh, Forest Company. A half is one of the partners of this company. Uh, so it's a, it's a technological based company incubated at the Federal University of Sosa. In Brazil, there is a, a tendency to, to, to incentivate the professors and the students uh, to establish their own uh, business, technological based companies. So, so we, we did that because we think it's important uh, to, to, do, to do this service for the companies. So that's the, the, uh, the you know, review of the, the facilities. In here you can see uh, plant growth and the inoculation facilities of the company. And these are our cloner team. Okay, we are three partners. Okay, and here are our research uh, fellows, and here are our employees. So that's uh, an overview of the uh, inoculation procedure. Okay, that we spray inoculate the plants and keep them. And under mist irrigation, and then uh, we evaluate uh, the disease. We use a, a scale that I'm going to show you. And then, in a family like this, we have a lot of variabilities some resistant plants, some high susceptible plants within the same species, which is very interesting. Evaluation, okay, nice, beautiful pushes. That's the disease scale that we developed. And I, I left this, some of this here in, for some colleagues in Australia. And some, because it's very easy scale uh, to be used and it's very helpful for screening. So we consider this as resistant and these are susceptible. Because although it, it has some spores, but uh, these are very tiny pushes which uh, can be considered as resistant. And this scale has been also used by our co Australian colleagues. A paper recently, a few weeks ago, what was recently published on Corimbia. Uh, this is done by Jeff Pegg and colleagues, Dave Lee. And they have used this scale for the Corimbias. And we also have a disease scale for field evaluations, which uh, it is also very helpful. And these two scales are they have a very good correlation, maybe 95% correlation if you use one or another in the field. This is not good for uh, uh, screening uh, inoculation, but it's very good for in the field. And here you can see a nice segregation for resistance, as you can see. A family which was inoculated have some highly resistant, highly resistant, and highly susceptible genotypes within the same family, okay? So this disease has a very strong genetic control. It's sometimes it's black and white, but sometimes we have also different degrees of resistance like slow rust. So we can have black and white like this, completely healthy, 
and completely effective. So uh, this uh, here we have some inter interspecific resistance, some species which are most susceptible to in our screening. Eucalyptus uh, croesiana, feotrica. Do you know this species here? I don't know where this species comes from, but it's from Australia for sure. It's feotrica, highly susceptible. Eucalyptus globulus, nitens, grandis. And the most resistant are Corima toriliana, Eucalyptus pelita, Eucalyptus urophila, and Eucalyptus microcortis. Although these are the, the frequency of resistant plants is higher, it's very high in this, sometimes you have some susceptible plants. Like we are we were in Cairns and in a, in, a, in a field trip, and Rafa, Rafael saw a disease on Eucalyptus pelita. So it, 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 it's very interesting. Okay? Although the plant material is highly resistant, you can have some susceptible plant. Although this highly susceptible, but we have some resistant plants. So it's very important in terms of disease control because you can select and clone those plants. Uh, in the susceptible ones, you have to, to leave them. So we did this uh, uh, screening for, for the, some Australian uh, provenance of the of the species here. It was before the fungus was re reported here many years ago because we have this this project. We have a project with the Australians about thir uh, 13 years ago. Okay, we started doing some work with the Australian colleagues. And at the time, uh, one of my graduate students, Val Zalza, he tested different uh, seed lots. And uh, uh, the green ones are at least the most important for us in Brazil. Eucalyptus tereticornis, pelita, camaldulenses, variety simulata, camaldulenses obtusa, uh, urofila, globulus, and grandis. So we have some, uh, this is the frequency of the resistant plants that we, we obtain from the, the seed lot uh, tested. Some like globulus, 60, almost 70% of the seed lot was, uh, was resistant. Although others, other uh, sources of, the, of globulus are highly successful, like Eucalyptus globulus from Jiroland, in, on provenance here, it's, highly, it's very it's well planted, it's much planted in Brazil and Uruguay. Uh, and the Grandis, it's maybe 50% resist, 50% susceptible. And Colesiana is highly susceptible. It depends a lot on the seed lot, okay, actually, the, the source of the plant material. And the best source of resistance are these species here, Corimbia. Calophila, Corimia intermedia, Corimia cellaris, Melaleuca erisifolia. We haven't seen this species, Rafa. No, I don't think so. So, but these are good source of resistance to our race in Brazil. So we have scored, we have evaluated uh, a little bit over 600 clones, and most of them, 67%, are susceptible and only 33% resist. But because why we have so many susceptible clones? This is because our plantations in Brazil are based mainly on grandes and uh, endurophila, ou seja, uh, eucalyptus grandes and urograndes. And sometimes they choose the wrong, uh, the wrong parent to cross. So uh, that's why we, we generate a lot of uh, susceptible plant material. But currently, uh, we have a, a project, an ongoing project, uh, and the companies are doing the crosses only between the resistant uh, plant material, or uh, sometimes if they know the genetic base, they can also cross with susceptible. But anyway, uh, we have to develop uh, new clones now with with the higher frequency of resistant uh, uh, plants, okay? But the commercial clones that we have are mostly susceptible. 
But these are clones that they are generated every year. And those which are successful, they don't plant. They just plant the resistant ones. Okay? One of the problems in the rust evaluation is, uh, uh, is for example, powder mildew, which is, sometimes happens, and also the a protoplast extrusion, the, the callus. So it, uh, it's, sometimes it happens. So you have to avoid, it's best to use a, a lower relative humidity in the environment after uh, the fund has been colonized. Uh, we have also developed, uh, found, uh, mapping, mapped uh, 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 a major gene for resistance, which is called PPR1. It's a very famous gene now. Okay, it's, it's, it's been worked for several colleagues. So uh, one of my graduate students, David Jungas, uh, he discovered and he mapped, mapped the uh, PPR1 closely linked to a, a, a rapid marker. At that time, that's what we had in hands. So it started marker, uh, linked to this marker. You can see here, these are a, 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 susceptible, a susceptible plant. That's a mother plant. This is the, the parent, the resistant parent. And this is the, the progeny. So uh, all plants that had has this uh, marker is resistant. And, and all those that we don't, which don't have the market are successful. So uh, we use almost 1,000 plants. So it's, it's it worked very nicely for this family. But since it's, it's a rapid marker, it's a, uh, a dominant marker, it's, it was not good for other uh, families. So later, uh, some colleagues uh, in, at Embrapa, uh, they mapped uh, the PPR1 in the uh, in a <clears throat> macro satellite uh, map, and so uh, this this genus is in the link group three, and uh, it's, it's has a it's, it's close to these two markers. So uh, 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 actually, that V by student was very lucky to find this. Uh, but we later, other studies by other, uh, some of my students uh, have shown that the, 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 the resistance is actually mostly quantitative. It's controlled by major, but also by ma minor genes. So we have both. Okay? But if you are lucky luck to find the resistor or more zygos plant like we did, so uh, this company, this was a project with Suzanne company, and uh, Susano, uh, Susano has, I think, about five of, uh, sorry, three or four of these homozygous plants in the orchard, seed orchard. So they collect the seeds from this plant so that uh, they have a resistant progeny. So it's currently, uh, Susano used this, or some of these plants, especially one of them I, that I know, uh, uh, from the orchard to, to have a uh, resistant plant by uh, seedlings. Okay, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> uh, later, and another st other studies has also, have also been done by other colleagues that my colleague uh, from my department, Sergio Bramoschenko, uh, he has also cloned uh, the PPR1 using uh, uh, map uh, based cloning, but the most important is to have a, a very good phenotyping of, uh, of for disease resistance, and also using the, the genetic uh, map uh, to uh, to clone this gene. So he has done this this study in cooperation with Susano, and it, it, it it's now currently being transformed. Some plants are being transformed with this gene to prove, to, to, to see which, which one carries the, uh, the gene. So it's, it's an ongoing project with Suzanne. So uh, in this uh, trip, I am 
uh, we have also taken a, an opportunity to to see how is the disease in Australia. So this is our route. Okay, it's a quite a, a good trip and long trip uh, over about five weeks trip. So we have been in Sydney, then you came to Brisbane. We are actually what we are doing. We are collecting. We would like to know how many genotypes of Puccinia pisidi uh, exist in Australia. So we are doing this this work in cooperation with some colleagues like Morin Glenn, uh, uh, Jeff Jeff Pegg, and other colleagues. So we are collecting uh, the the fungus from different host species, and we we put the 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 spores in alcohol, and these will be sent to to, uh, to Tasmania to Morin Glenn's lab. And uh, part of the of this will stay in, in Brisbane and will deposit, be deposited in a herbarium. I, I'm not I don't know if it's in Brisbane, but probably more is going to send this to to uh, herbarium. And we are not taking anything. We didn't bring anything to here, and we are not taking anything to Brazil. Okay. Uh, so it's uh, we it's interesting because uh, we. We, we are doing a nice collection. We, we collect now over uh, 73 spe uh, specimens, okay, and we expect to collect some more in uh, in Yarraway, back to Melbourne, okay. So let's see how many species we would like to have. 100. I tried to to convince uh, uh, José to take me to the botanical garden to get some here, but uh, he didn't take me there, so. I think the disease is here, but uh, I don't know. Maybe tomorrow I'll tell you. Okay, <laughs> that's a joke. Okay, <laughs> for sure don't have it yet. Okay. But uh, uh, to be frank to you, I think you have some spots here that we may find the disease in the future. Okay, it's it's a not a great chance, but there is some chance to to see it. So please go to the. The botanical gardens where they irrigate the plants, they keep the plants nicely fertilized, and in the nurseries, so are the place that, and the shade, it lacks the shade, okay, shade, a place, so it, it's it's very good place to, to look at the disease. So here we have seen uh, the impact. Well, the question, would, what are the impacts of the disease here in Australia, in the native uh, vegetation? So we have seen it at a, at a, it's not a nice a spot, Brian Bay. Is it? <laughs> it's a beautiful place, okay? <laughs> it's one of the most beautiful places we have seen. It's, it's very nice. We have been there. And, uh, and unfortunately, we saw uh, some Rhodomyrtus psygeoids highly uh, affected by the disease. It's, it's killing the disease. It was interesting because some tourists that were passing, they were interested in understanding what was going on there. And, and they, it's very interesting to, to see the people's uh, interest on the, the, the natural vegetation. Then we show them what the disease was doing. So many seedlings that are coming are being uh, killed by the fungus. So I think this is an endangered species, isn't it? It, I think it's endangered species, so it, it can be very important in those species. And also, we saw in a plantation, in a commercial plantation, lemon, lemon myrtle. myrtle. Uh, do you know this species? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this grower, uh, Gary, uh, he has a very nice plantation. And uh, he, part of his plantation, you can see here different clones, and some are highly damaged by the disease. So there is a, a lot of variability. Okay? So uh, he was very worried about the disease because it's, as a, it's a tea tree, so you cannot apply fungicide. So you have to go by resistance. So I think uh, uh, the Australian government has to give some support for the growers and also in terms of the environment. So it, 
we need more grants, we need more money to study that, okay? So I hope uh, the, the Australian government can help a lot this, because it could be a very important disease in the natural ecosystem and also for the growers, for the local growers. So uh, since in Australia we have, uh, it's, the fire is very frequent in many places in Australia, and the disease, the fungus, loves the new juvenile tissue. So it's very important to see the impact of the disease after fire. And Rafael got some, found some nice ones in one of the places we, we went in, in Cairns area. No, in, yeah, in this place here was in, yeah, but yeah, anyway. It was at Ken's uh, area, okay. Beer. Beer. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> In Queensland, okay. <laughs> so it would be very interesting to to see to follow up uh, what is going to happen in the future uh, after fire with the shoots, the corpus, okay, for different species. So it has to be followed up. So, uh, what are the possible impacts of myrtle rust in Australia? First, is narrowing the genetic base of highly susceptible with nature species. It can happen, the narrowing uh, the genetic base. Uh, fortunately, at least for localism that I, I know better, we have a lot of variability. So, maybe the impact is not so great. Maybe not so great. But we have to understand that. What will be the impact uh, uh, in, in terms of narrowing genetic base of highly susceptible species? Uh, it will put a risk of highly susceptible endangered species like a pseudo, like a rhodomyrtus pseudoides. For sure, it will because it kills, it kills, it's killing some plants, and it will also limit commercial growth of lemon myrtle. Uh, and other potential commercial searchable species such as Eucalyptus grandis, Eucalyptus corleziana, Globulus, Corimbia, several Corimbia, and Melaleucas, and so on. And uh, there is also a possible high risk of rust incidence on shoots after fire. That's what we think. So, in conclusion, a uh, rust caused by Puccinia psygia is a disease of worldwide importance. So it's very important for, all, for many of us. It's, uh, it's in, uh, Puxip City is increasing its geographic distribution in the host range. Almost every year we have two or three more spots of the disease. And we have a strong selection by host, because a strong selection by host occurs in Puxip City population. From Brazil, we have seen that. Let's say the fungus from guava is in Psidio, uh, from uh, Guinness, it's quite separate from the fungus from eucalyptus and Psidio jambo. So there is a strong uh, selection by host species, they group separately. There is a high, uh, a high inter, inter, inter specific variability of eucalyptus, which allows selection of resistant genotypes for cloning for large-scale plantations, which is very good. That's what we do in Brazil, okay? And rust resistance in eucalyptus is controlled by major and minor genes, okay? So we have a, a qualitative and quantitative resistance. And variability in virulence in the fungal population has to be considered for, sele for selection of rust resistant genotypes. For example, we will the resistant plant material selected here will be resistant to the races, to the fungus that we have in Brazil. That's an open question that has to be tested, like we did for uh, or here in Hawaii. So these are my host uh, Rust team. Uh, there's Davi, Adelica, Edval, Lucio, Alexandre, Rodrigo. Carla, Marisanja, Cristina, and Pedro. And these are the current uh, Rust team. There are four 
people working. And uh, Patrice is coming here, I'll say, as I mentioned to you. Uh, Lucio is, uh, is one of my postdocs. He's a geneticist. So it, we need to work a lot with the geneticists. It has to be a, a, we need people from different, uh, different backgrounds. And these are two undergraduate students. As I mentioned to you, it's very important to, to, keep, to have the undergraduate students working with the graduate students, then they will take over the, continue the work later. Okay, so it's very important. And you can see how happy they are. So it means that uh, <laughs> uh, I am a very good professor in terms of giving good facilities for them and, okay, and good fellowships. So, uh, uh, yeah, nice. Here we have some uh, uh, a visit of some Australian people a long time ago. You may uh, know some of them. This is in near Tomerap. Uh, he, she was uh, at Cicero at the time, and we have some uh, uh, also colleagues and, and friends. Uh, this unfortunately died recently. Mm -hmm. uh, was uh, I forgot his name now, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, and this is one of uh, the nice views of the disease. You can see here. Okay, uh, that's. Um, uh, Kenot was very important for this project that we initiated uh, 13 years ago, and some other uh, colleagues and students. That's uh, in it, in my students in my lab, and it's Steve Langrell, okay, my lab. And that's uh, one of the, the last uh, tech of views of, of Angus Carnegie last year, in April last year. Angus? Look at uh, here, and he gave a seminar for us, okay? And uh, he's, he also visited our company. And, and this angus in Australia, a few weeks ago, and this angus in Brazil, okay? <laughs> With the barbecue. Uh, as you know, barbecue is, is a very popular uh, meat meal in Brazil, okay? So he does nice job too. When in Brazil he did a nice, he cooked a nice barbecue. Okay. But actually, I think he loves rust as well. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And this is my current research team. I have uh, uh, five postdocs. Okay. Half was not included until a few weeks ago, but now he is included. And these are my um, uh, PhD students. And uh, Leonardo is, is in the US now. Patrice is coming to Australia. And uh, Denise is going to the US too for one year. And this is a, a master student. Then I have also the undergraduate students and a couple of them, most of them are, are doing foreign engineering and uh, this is a very good system to, to give the opportunity for the undergraduate students because we can select the best ones to, to go for degree. Okay, so it's a, a very good way to, to select good students. And we have uh, many students that want to come to our lab uh, every, every year, so it's, it's very good, okay? But we need grants to keep them, okay? So we have to work hard. But I'm very pleased. I, like, I love this. I like the students. I like the way the work that I do. So I'm very happy. So I have to acknowledge several people uh, from different uh, places, uh, uh, from US, uh, Australia, and, and, and Brazil, okay, Uruguay. So we have many people that we are collaborating. They are very keen in, in collaboration. I think that's the way that we can increase, can progress, can learn. So, and I also have to acknowledge several agencies that uh, has helped us uh, along the years and providing facilities and grants that 
for us to survive. We need that. Okay. So it's very important. So I have to acknowledge them. And I would like to thank you all to attend and also the online people. Okay, so thank you very much. I would be pleased to, to answer.